This Week in Startups is brought to you by Captera, the leading free online resource to find the best software solutions. Visit captera.com slash twist for free today to find the right tools to make 2019 the year for your business. Gainsight. The Gainsight Customer Cloud is the only way to align your tech stack so your customer is at the center of every business decision. Turn your customers into your biggest growth engine by visiting Gainsight.com slash twist today. And Calm. Seize the day and sleep the night with the help of Calm, the number one app for sleep. This week in Startups listeners get 25% off a Calm premium subscription at Calm.com slash twist. That's C-A-L-M dot com slash twist. Apply for the next Launch Accelerator cohort. Applications are due October 14th. Learn more and apply at launchaccelerator.co. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Startups. On today's Ask Jason, I'm going to answer six amazing questions from our incredible listeners. Uh, what indicators are there of a great founder so you can make an investment? That was a great question. Maybe uh, should I use crowdfunding as a source of raising capital, equity crowdfunding, dealing with the absence of investor updates? That's one for angels. That's very frustrating. Um, what is the changing makeup of an ideal founder, especially in today's turbulent times? And how has angel investing changed since I released my book? I'm going to give you that answer and more on This Week in Startups today. It's an all Ask Jason episode. You're going to love all six of these questions. And I think you're going to like the answers too. Stick with us. All right. Our next question is from Darius. He is part of our Patreon. If you want to go to Patreon and do a search for This Week in Startups, you too can get your question answered first and guaranteed, unless it's really a bad question, here on This Week in Startups. Darius asks me, what are the top differentiators between founders of unicorn companies and the zombie companies? Traits you can detect from the early days. This is a great question. Uh, great job, uh, Darius. So what I'll say is I find that the founders at the early stage who are obsessed with their product, have great craftsmanship in the product, and have product velocity tend to have a better shot at winning than those that do not have an obsession with their product, do not have craftsmanship in it, and do not have product velocity. So I'm going to break down this product piece a little bit here and give you some examples because examples always matter. So an example would be when I first saw Uber, Travis was showing it to me and the taxi, it was called Uber Taxi at the time. And the first thing he said to me is, it's going to be called uber.com. It's not going to be called taxi because you're not actually getting a taxi, right? So there was this sort of, he almost preempted the discussion around, we're not going to call it taxi. We know that's the bad name, but he just had to get some domain started. Also, on the map, instead of the car facing the right direction, they had only had one icon of a cab. And it would be uh, moving down the street as if it was spinning out or drifting in Tokyo Drift. And you're like, why? And he's like, listen, we're, we're trying to figure out with the GPS how to make the phone. This is the iPhone 3G back then. We're going to try to make that uh, cab face the right direction. So we're going to have like five different versions of the cab and icons, right? That's a level of detail that you don't often see uh, from a founder. Additionally, the founders who are customer obsessed, customer focused, tend to win more often. So we're seeing like a, a, a focus on product which naturally means you're focused on the customer, right? The, the product is what the customer experiences, right? So here we go. The customer is experiencing something called Thumbtack. You may have remembered Thumbtack, one of the uh, unicorns we've invested in. And Marco, when he was showing me the product, it was originally more like a directory than fill out a form and a dossier, then get quotes back of who might be a great service provider. It was originally like a directory, almost like a Yelp. And in the Yelp-like version of Thumbtack, the 1.0, which he pivoted away from, okay, pivoted away from it, in that first version, he had a little icon that was like a driver's license and a house. And I was like, what are those on the website? Because this is pre-web, really. And you hover over them. And when you would hover over them, it said, we have the driver's license on file for this service provider, and we know their address. Why is that important? Well, what he said to me was, if you invite somebody to come to your house to clean the gutters or to do the lawn work or clean the pool or fix uh, your cabinets, 
you might want to know that you've done a background check on them, where they live, and that you got a driver's license. The person's not going to come murder your family or rob your house, right? And so that's a level of customer focus and understanding that you don't always see. It's very hard to fake a deep knowledge of the customer and, a, and an ability to make the product improve week after week. That's called product velocity. Now, when you're talking to a founder and the product hasn't changed and you're in week three of talking to them, you might want to think to yourself, well, what's going on here? Why isn't the product improving? And what you might uncover is that they don't have any developers or product people on the team. It's just a bunch of idea people, business people. In other words, people with no skills. Well, that's not what you want to invest in. You want to invest in people with skills, people who know how to make great product, people who know how to make great technology. If the product has zero velocity, the chances of it becoming a zombie are almost certain. That's why we call them zombie companies, because they're just... Uh dragging along and you ask them, hey, what's changed in the product? And they go, that's why you want that product velocity. Now, finally, the founders that I see who really build the unicorn companies, the meaningful companies, they're defiant. They believe something needs to exist in the world, that the world needs to change in some way. And they are going to get it done with or without you, the investor. And you're either going to be along for the ride or you're not. So defiant without a focus on product, without a focus on customers, is just delusion. Okay? There's nothing, there's nothing there. It's just an empty can making a lot of noise. But if you have somebody who's defiant with skills to make a great product and deep customer knowledge, boy, do they have a chance to do something meaningful in the world. So that's what I want you to look at. Look at that product understanding, knowledge, velocity, detail, craftsmanship, and ask them questions. Hey, how does the product work? Walk me through it. And then ask them questions. You see something that looks a little buggy, ask them, hey, what's going on with this? And if they say, that's on the bug tracker, it's going to be fixed next week, then you check, hey, next week, did it get fixed? You're in no rush. Get to know the product. Get to know the product velocity. Get to know the founder. Maybe even talk to the customers. This is a lost art. I want you to talk to at least three customers before you invest in a company. And Defiant alone is an empty can making a lot of noise, but defiant with those skills and with that customer focus means a chance at being a unicorn. Okay, great question, Darius. Okay, next up is Saheed. He is a Patreon member. You can go to Patreon and do a search for This Week in Startups and throw us two bucks and you get yourself a bunch of uh, content. Uh, you get an ad-free version of the show if you don't like ads and you get to go jump the line, jump the fence and get to the front of the line with Ask Jason. So here we go. Saeed asks, how do I deal with the absence of updates when investing through a syndicate, specifically on AngelList? So when you're an angel investor, you want to get updates from your companies, and sometimes they don't update you. This is incredibly frustrating. And for the first 100 deals I did, I was pulling my hair out. Oh my God, what's going on with this investment? And when the founders were in trouble, many of them elected to not send an update. And the reason they weren't sending updates was because the company was failing. Now, think about that for a second. Your company's failing. You have investors who have more experience than you typically, and they have more money to keep funding you. And instead of talking to them about your problems, you ignore your problems, you ignore your investors who can help solve them, and you hope that things will get better so the next month you can send an update that has a chart that's going up to the right. It's the exact wrong dynamic you want to have with founders. So what we did was... We put in our contracts in something called a side letter. A side letter is just an agreement um, that's outside of the normal scope of the investment documents. And our side letter says you'll send 10 updates a month with the following information in them. Revenue, burn, revenue spend, and you take those two numbers and you combine them, you wind up getting your, um, your burn. How, many, how much cash is in the bank at the end of the month? How many months of runway that would be with that month's burn? Yada, yada. And they can then give you a little commentary about it. If you don't have that agreement in place, you're going to be chasing founders. The founders you're chasing are likely failing. So to your original question, I don't think you should bother haranguing founders who don't want to send them. You should just not fund those founders anymore. You should just pass on investing in them. And you should just make an agreement with future founders that they will do this. 
And if you're investing a tiny amount of money, like two, three, four thousand dollars, maybe you don't have the ability to put any kind of uh, pressure on them in the negotiation to do this. But if you're putting in 25 or 50K, you obviously do. Um, and then here's a way to actually solve it in a non confrontational way, because this can become like a daddy or mommy's checking in on you, you know, toxic kind of relationship thing. And it has ha that happened for me in the past with this one dipshit company from Y Combinator that refused to give updates to the syndicate that I convinced, or not convinced, I shared the deal with them. And so they, you know, a lot of people will look at me at my investing and want to follow me. So I'm not convincing them. They're convincing themselves, obviously. I can't put a gun to anybody's head. But I feel a little bit of responsibility. And they wouldn't send updates. And I was like, guys, your business is failing. You're going sideways and you won't update anybody. Why? And they're like, well, because we don't have to. And I was like, oh my God, that's the most Y Combinator entitled nonsense I've ever heard. Putting that aside, we have a tracker internally. The tracker has the months of the year. Somebody does email us in June. We send an email in July. Uh, hey, we didn't get June. Is it in the spam folder? Or do, what email did you send it to? Or did we miss it? You know, non-accusatory. Then July. They missed July and we email them in August. Hey, we didn't get June or July. Haven't heard from you. Would love an update on our investment. Not accusatory. Just would love an update on our investment in company name. Now you get to, okay, no update in August. You're three months in and it's September. Here's how you handle it. No more asking for updates. Hey, Jane. Hey, Nick. Uh, would love to get an update on our investment in Acme Company. Which of the following dates works for coffee, lunch, or a quick Zoom phone call, go to meeting, whatever? And you just put the three dates in there. Would love to know how I might be able to help. And so what you're doing is giving them permission to not write an update, but to do a phone call. And that shows that you're willing to put a little time in as well. But it's very easy to just pop off an email back and forth. Where's my update? Ba, 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 back and forth. And it gets toxic real quick because people who are under pressure like these founders are might snap. They might think you're being annoying. They might think that you're overly obsessed with them and their performance and you only put in 5K. So leave the past companies um, in terms of haranguing them. Assume, you know, like 70, 80% of these companies fail, but you'll make it up on the winners. And then start engaging people in productive dialogue over a cup of coffee, the old cup of joe. Can I buy you a cup of joe? Can I take you to lunch or dinner? How about a quick phone call? And how can I help? Right. And I watch some of these, uh, you know, syndicate members and some of them get a little frisky. I'll be I'll be honest. Some of them get a little obnoxious and I understand it because it is frustrating to get no update if you are an investor. But let's take a different tact. Let's be not accusatory. Let's come at these founders knowing they're under pressure, knowing they're probably got a huge fear of failure and that you are OK with failure. You just are not OK with failure without having a chance to help. Right. Think about that for a second. Everybody's big fear is failure. In fact, if you're the angel investor, your fear is losing your money. You're acting out of fear. That's why the tension's up a little bit. Right. I can I can feel it in your in your question. And that's what they're feeling. They're scared, too. So you're both scared. But you're both in the same boat. So you might as well be working together to get back to shore and not have this turn into a cannibalistic situation out at sea. Work together. See if you can find some fish, some fresh water. You saw the movie Castaway. Let's collaborate, okay? And the way to collaborate is not to be accusatory. Be helpful. Hey, I'm sure you're super busy. I know you're under a lot of stress. Was hoping I might be able to help. Can we do a quick call? So now you're giving that little permission. Quick call. Can I take you for a quick bite to eat? Can I buy you dinner? Ah, you're offering something up. Hey, I'll buy you dinner. Uh, and that's what founders really want. I always tell people founders, uh, like kids, uh, they spell love, T-I-M-E. So just offer a little bit of that T-I-M-E and see what happens. Okay, let's take another question. You need to find the perfect software to solve your problem at work. But how do you find it? Well, you go to Capterra because you need to find a solution fast to whatever your pressing issue is and you really want to know what all your options are. Well, with over 1 million reviews now in 700 specific categories of software, you can right now figure out if the software you already paid for is the right software or if you need to upgrade it or if you need to add something, right? And here, my guy, Presh. 
at launch is looking for new sales automation software. We need to make that sales process really efficient. And with Captera, he goes through all the reviews. He sets a couple of filters like the number of employees we're gonna use in the system. And it gets this nice side-by-side -side comparison of different products with the ratings for how easy they are to use. Cause some software is really complicated. Some is really easy. That's the value proposition, right? As well as obviously the value for money and the features and the functionality. Well, we picked and we were able to select the free trial option and we tested it out and we went with PipeDrive. It turns out PipeDrive solved some problems for us. Uh, and we, we got that because we used Captera. Captera is amazing. It's basically like Yelp, but for software, and I've always wanted a Zagat or a Yelp for software, and it exists at Captera, C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A dot com slash twist. Go to Captera dot com slash twist today, and this is how much it costs. It's free. It doesn't cost you anything. You're going to find great tools, and they save millions of people. they got to save them billions of hours of research and mistakes. Don't make a mistake. Get software selection simplified. That's it. Software selection simplified captera.com slash twist okay let's get back to this episode all right let's take a live call from bomani bomani are you there yes i am jason uh where are you calling from i'm calling from san francisco okay san francisco where in san francisco let's get a little more detailed here the tenderloin uh, i take okay. it okay the lovely tenderloin. We're, uh... <laughs> Calling from Nopa in San Francisco, okay. north of the Panhandle, for the okay. listeners. No problem with that. Okay. If you're in the Tenderloin, I suggest you run. Quick. Get out of there. <laughs> okay. Uh, you have a question for me. Uh, you're uh, new to the show, long time to the show? Yes, new to the show. Thanks right. Thanks for having me on. Okay. What's your question? Sure, Jason. My question for you is, what are your thoughts around crowdfunding from sites such as Indiegogo, Republic, Start Engine? as a mechanism to raise capital and what do you uh and what are the things you would advise founders as far as things to consider before committing to some of these sites okay great question now we should start by saying one of these sites indiegogo has i believe their foot in two different types of funding there's equity sure. crowdfunding where you're getting money from 100 percent of americans anybody can participate accredited investors and non-accredited investors, basically rich people and people who are not rich yet. Sure. And they also do, like Kickstarter does, a Kickstarter type functionality where you can order a product in advance. But you're asking specifically about equity crowdfunding, correct? Correct. Great. So there's a couple of different ways to raise money for your company. One of them is to go to venture capitalists. They are moving downstream. They want companies with $3 million in revenue now. Or maybe founders who've taken a company public. So where would founders who haven't sold a company for a lot of money or don't have millions of dollars in revenue, where would they get funding? Seed funds and angels and uh, accelerators, which is where I operate. Accelerators put $100,000 in for 6%. Seed funds will put in 250 k to a million dollars for anywhere from 10 to 20%, let's say. And then there are these right. new uh, concepts, which is equity crowdfunding. I actually did this for Inside.com. Equity crowd, and I did it through uh, Seed Invest, which was off, wasn't on your list, but I think they're the number one. I only know okay. about Republic and Seed Invest. Both of those have pretty solid deal flow, um, and they uh, run really tight ships over there. I know both of the founders, and I, I think they both do a great job. Indiegogo, I don't I have, I don't know anything about their equity crowdfunding and how that's going. And Start Engine. I've seen some of their deal flow. It's a little bit hit or miss, I think, in my mind, but it's been a while, so I won't comment on that one. But I can tell you, this is uh, a little more complicated. There's a little bit of red tape. You have to publish financials. You have to have reviews of this, and you're doing a lot of work for small checks. It can work, and it can drive, I would say, on average, low hundreds of thousands of dollars in investment. So if you want a bunch of civilians to put in $100, $250, $500, $1,000, and be involved in your company, it's a great idea. Of course, it's a lot of work because that means you're collecting a lot of checks, and that's why these sites exist, is to right. bring all that money together. So keep your expectations low as to the number of dollars that will come in, and expect that it's going to be a lot of work. The reason I did it for Inside was because I thought it would be very cool to have the people who read our newsletters invest in the company. We had a big email list. So if you were a music festival 
If you were a restaurant with a large number of email addresses, if you were a niche product or piece of software that had 10,000 customers paying 10 bucks a month or uh, 10,000 customers who had the free product, they might very much enjoy investing in your company. So I think that's the magic of it. And I think that's the future of it. Imagine, if you will, a company like LinkedIn or Uber allowing people who were non-accredited investors who worked in, let's say, in LinkedIn's case, HR and hiring. Well, they knew that that product would be successful. So, But they might not have the ability to write a $50,000 check, but they might easily write a five hundred. An Airbnb host might say, you know what? I'm going to take 10 nights a year that I rent my place for $200. I'm going to put that $2,000 towards being an investor in Airbnb. That's the magic of it. Now, it takes 10 years for those things to play out. And they just started in the last two years. So there is not a lot of track record here. But I am, in fact, bullish on the space. I do think it's going to work. I do think it's the future of investing. If you choose to do it, like syndicates, which I was the first on AngelList, and now we moved it to the syndicate.com. We have our own sort of mini platform uh, going. It's not really a competitor to AngelList. It's just one syndicate, but with a little bit of software behind it now. We were the first to ever do that, and we did it in a company called com.com. That was the first syndicate, which turned out pretty good. It's the highest performing one ever. It's a unicorn. And at the beginning of syndicates, which are only for accredited investors, people said, this is too complicated. It's too much time. It's too much work. Well, it wasn't. And it worked out great. And now it's a standard in Silicon Valley. It's a standard around the world to run a syndicate. And no founder is afraid of it. I predict in another five to 10 years, we'll have many people doing equity crowdfunding on these platforms. Do you have any great. follow-up That's questions? That's exciting. That's exci- yeah, no, that's really exciting, Jason. I'm, I'm glad to, to get your insight and, and thoughts on on these sites and how powerful they can be, especially if it's uh, a B two C company and some of the some of the users love the product and want to continue to see it grow and be successful. Okay, uh, well, good luck with your company and good luck with your fundraising. I would uh, I would start with Republic and Seed Invest. Those are the two I know the founders of. So I'd start there. It costs a little bit of money to do this, but actually those companies don't make a ton of money from this. I think they're going to make their money from having a little equity piece in your company. So I think there, right. there's a good alignment, right? Uh, so good luck right. with it uh, and keep watching. Thanks so much. All right. Awesome. Thanks, Have Jason. Have a great day. Cheers. All right. We got another uh, question. This one from Patty. She wrote us, with so many founders being let go recently, uh, we work, I think, would be their jewel. Uh, what will the new look of an ideal founder be from an investor's point of view? This is a great question, Patty. Very, very prescient, very of the moment. Well, I can tell you what it won't look like. Entitlement and smoking weed on planes. Smoking the weed on your G650. That era is over. Hard stop. Hard stop. No more 650, no more weed on the 650, okay? Both. Ixnay on the 650 and Ixnay. I mean... Can you imagine WeWork CEO, all that bad behavior, it just adds up. Now, if the company was performing extremely well, we wouldn't be talking about any of these issues. If you want to have a G650, if you want to fly private, if you want to buy everybody lunch, you better be Google. You better be Facebook. Nobody's talking about Zuckerberg spending something like 10, 5 or $10 million a year on security. They, they have a fleet of jets at Google. You ever hear about the Google jets? You haven't heard about the Google Jets in a long time. You know why? It's a money printing machine. Shareholders don't care if you're printing about perks, if you're printing money. If you, Listen, if Bezos wants another jet and he wants Amazon to pay for it, Google wants another three jets, go for it. They want to bring in the Neiman Ranch, New York Strip. They want to go with a Miyazaki Wagyu. I don't care. Print me money. Got the money printing machine. You're good. But if you're a WeWork and you're renting $600 desks for $300, for $300 and you got all this arbitrage going on, man, come on. Come on. And this guy's walking around barefoot in front of Pete's Tavern. Come on. You can't be walking barefoot in New York. This guy's deranged. I'm sorry. I Summer camp? Summer camp? This guy's running a summer camp? He's, he's going to be a first trillionaire? I mean, I'm an insanely driven, narcissistic person. You guys listen to the pod. Listen, I'm not walking barefoot in Manhattan. 
I don't have a G650, and I'm not saying I'm going to be the next trillionaire when I rent desks for a living. This kind of behavior is nuts. Barefoot in New York. Do you know how many people have puked in front of Pete's Tavern? There's so much gum on the street. Gum's the least of your worries. Do you, do you know how I used to walk my bulldog past Pete's Tavern? You know what Toro did in front of Pete's Tavern? I want to tell you, man. You've seen a bulldog with diarrhea? It's not pretty, guys. It's not pretty. Listen, I, I just got to just put a dot in it. Whenever things get frothy, which is what we're at. We're in a frothy market. Whenever people get super excited because companies like Uber are making over $10 billion a year, people get a little ahead of their skis. Airbnb, these companies are amazing. And then a couple companies slip in and people get a little delusional. They suspend disbelief and you get a Theranos or a WeWork on the margins. What I encourage you to do and what I think is going to happen in the investment community is that the ideal founder is focused on unit economics. That's it. Profitability. It's just a return to profitability. At the end of the day, there's something called a price earnings ratio, not a priced barefoot ratio or a priced per ride ratio. At the end of the day, it's price to earnings, P-E ratio. So when I go on CNBC, those old school cats, they just want to know about the P-E. And they're going to be plowing a bunch of money and they don't want to hear some story about growth. They don't want to hear some story about disruption. At the end of the day, they want to hear about the price earnings. And that's it. Price to earnings. Price to earnings. They want to know that it's a profitable concern. If your concern is not profitable, you need to get concerned with your profitability. That's it. Get concerned with that profitability. The world's changed. There used to be just a handful of vendors, but now with new technologies, vendors are developing and delivering products fast. We call it product velocity in the business. And there's much more competition. So you got to be on your game to win. You need to put your customers at the center of everything you do. And the Gainsight Customer Cloud can help you do that. Gainsight PX helps you understand how users interact with your product. And here is my CMO, Presh, doing it, looking at our active users, looking at the sessions, uh, and he applies a bunch of filters to look at the activity and growth and which of these users are active. And he uses this product feature to tag and track the different product elements to figure out what features they're using and maybe where they stall and when they stop using the product, uh, as well as, of course, where they're spending most of their time. Gainsight has a suite of products, obviously, and Gainsight CDP is where they capture and segment customer data. This is to drive tailored engagement. And then there's Gainsight CS, which is your customer success managers uh, tool where they can get all that aggregated data and optimize customer support. There's Gainsight RO, which is renewal and expansion. Uh, it's That's a critical part of all of these SaaS products. You need to get renewals and you need to land and expand. We all know that. And there's Gainsight CX which is the feedback platform that generates deeper insights about your customers so you can improve their happiness. So here is your call to action. The Gainsight Customer Cloud is the only solution that provides everything you need to turn customers into your biggest growth engine. So discover how your company can benefit from the Gainsight Customer Cloud by using gainsight.com slash twist today. G-A-I-N-S-I-G-H-T dot com slash twist. Gainsight.com slash twist. Go there now and check it out. And thank you to the team at Gainsight for supporting independent media like This Week in Startup. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, next on the line is Peter. Peter, are you there? I'm here. Hi, Jason. How are you doing? Uh, you're calling from the 206. Is that your area code? And where are you based? Yeah, I'm in, I'm in Seattle. All right, Seattle. Very nice. Uh, so what's your question? How has angel investing changed since you wrote your book? Ah, great. Well, the book came out, as you know, in the summer of 2017, two years ago. And I don't perceive it has changed all that much on a fundamental basis. There has been an increase in the number of deals. Every year, there seem to be more companies to choose from. And every year, the companies have a quicker path to revenue, a quicker path to profitability, and they're scaling faster, and the quality's going up. So, you know, you watch this, uh, you have this television in Seattle yet? You have the TV thing? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so you have that television, and then, like, the HBO came out, things got a little bit better, and then the Netflix, and uh, on and on and on. And what you're seeing is, like, TV shows are becoming super sophisticated, right? Because they're building on the past success. So 
The Shield, uh, you know, The Wire, Sopranos, and now Secession. And you're just seeing like the quality level of these shows, the acting, the writing, the production value, and even things like um, the special effects, which we never thought would ever make it to television shows with Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones looks better than The Lord of the Rings, right? So what happens in society, and in, it's one of the great things about capitalism, is that we build on each other's successes. So the success of George Lucas with Star Wars led to, you know, industrial light and magic, and, you know, it, it just built and built and built to now people are making TV shows or even YouTube videos with people doing lightsaber battles that look better than the lightsaber battle in the original Star Wars. These are kids at home, right? And that's just a 30 or 40 year arc. Same thing is happening in startups. I would say every four or five years, the quality of the startups we see doubles. So in the last two years, I think the quality has gone up 30, 40% of these companies. The other thing that's happened is I'm seeing a lot more angel investors out there. Now, this is a function of the fact that I have a syndicate at the syndicate.com where I work with a lot of angel investors. I teach a course, angel.university. I've done it, I think, 14 times around the world. So I'm seeing an increased level of sophistication from angel investors. I can take some credit for that, but I think also you could share that credit with Y Combinator, Techstars, uh, random people doing stuff on YouTube, Naval and Angelist. A lot of people are sharing knowledge about early stage investing. Even the Twitter is... Uh, pretty popular with the investors. So everybody seems to be upping their game a bit. And if I had to describe one thing that's happened and put it in a nutshell, on the investor side, I already told you about the startup side, which is everybody just gets 10, 20% better every year, which means we double every three or four years the quality of a startup on average. The investors are getting more sophisticated. And the early stage investors now know how to read a convertible note. They know how to look at a safe and say, oh, maybe that's not so safe anymore. Oh, I saw the episode with TopTail. Oh, I know about expiration dates, right? So the sophistication level in the early stage is going up amongst investors. They're not suckers anymore. The angel investors used to be the suckers at the table. Now they're like, wait a second. I need to own a bigger percentage. I need to have pro rata rights. I need to have a side letter so I get those monthly updates from my founders. I need to have a board seat if I'm over 5%. I need to know about how these funds are being spent and I want my founders to have a plan. You know, the overall professionalism of angels, I think, has gone up significantly in the last two years. So those are the two sides of the table and how it's changed, I think. Does it make sense? Okay. Yes. Hey, if you bring Angel University to Seattle, I'll buy the first ticket. Um, may That's I fantastic. Ask, Absolutely. Yeah, go ahead. May I ask two quick follow-ups? Yeah, of course. Sure. Have you changed your opinion on how to double down on winners? For instance, with the big funds yeah. out there, are they pushing up Series A and B valuations so much that it might make more sense for an angel to keep investing at the seed stage instead of doubling down? Yeah, that's a great question. So there are people who are, some would argue, overpaying. Now, clearly, we see overpaying before the IPO, right? There's been a lot of scrutiny in the last couple of weeks over what SoftBank paid for their shares of Uber, WeWork, and other companies. So, and then there was scrutiny before that about what Andreessen Horowitz was paying for their shares in companies. And then before that, um, you know, people were looking at Yuri Milner and DST and saying, are they overpaying? That typically was at the later stages, right? That CD pre-IPO. In the A and the B, I do see a little bit of frothiness, but I think if you know it's a winner, if they're doubling revenue every six months, I like to put that second bet in. I am a fan of the second bet. But I do think maybe the third bet, maybe that's when you want to stay pat. And then you start getting to the fifth, sixth, seventh bet, uh, if you even have that opportunity. It might be time to start thinking about, maybe I sell 10% of my position. Maybe I sell a third of my position, take some chips off the table, right? And, and that's the way to play the overvaluing of startups. I'll give some caveats, okay. though. There were people who sold Uber at the 4 or $5 billion valuation who were in the $5 million round, and it was like, well, this is a really big lift here. You know, I'm, I'm no pun intended, but I'm 1,000x on my investment. It, you wouldn't be 1,000x on your lift investment, obviously. It's a second-tier company, but putting that aside, if you were on the Uber side of the thing, you would. And so you got that massive lift in Uber, uh, and you didn't get an Uber uh, lift and lift. But- Putting that aside, um, that was a mistake because there was a 10x yet to come. I did sell some Uber 
when it was uh, probably in the $50 billion range, which is what it's trading at right now. And I did that to Masayoshi's on a little bit before that. So pairing a little bit of your position early gives you that, what we call in the industry, idiot insurance. Just a little bit of covering your bases, times 100, times 1,000. If you got one of those big winners and you're not independently wealthy and can let it all ride, I like taking a little bit of chips off the table, putting a floor into your uh, how much you've made. I like that. Now, would I be plowing money? This is why I don't play the public markets. If you're playing the public markets, as we've seen, the pricing has been a little bit high or a little bit low for startups. And a lot of people are arguing now that the public markets, the companies are pretty well established and they're turning into maybe not hyper growth companies, but just growth companies. And so that is a different type of company. And so that's going to drive more people into the early stage. When you drive more people into the early stage, it might drive up valuation. I can't see the difference between a 5 to $15 million seed round and a 25 to $75 million A or, you know, 50 to $100, 50000000 million B. I think it's probably still worth placing additional bets because you consolidate on your winners. If you can get to that Series A and Series B, you get to that $150 million, it's probably not by accident. It's hard to close those $150 million rounds. I can tell you, I see it every day. A lot of my founders are like, yeah, I'm going to go close to Series B and get $20 million for 20%. I'm like, okay, let me know how I can help. And they come back and they're like, eh, I think I need to do a seed extension. I think I need to do a Series A extension. It's hard. So if they do get it done, you might have people who are overpaying on the margins, but they're overpaying for value. And if it's a competitive space and you got a little bit of that extra pro rata, I, I and it's obviously situational, I think... By and large, you want to get that second bet in. The third or fourth, you're going to probably want to really think it through. Make sense? Sure. Are you struggling to sleep? I know I am. I got a lot on my mind. There's a lot of things going on. My mind's constantly racing. I'm investing in companies. I'm doing the pot. I'm writing books. There's a lot of stress in my life, right? I got also got to raise a family. Well, one in three U.S. adults does not get enough sleep. Now, when you think about getting sleep, I want you to think about Calm.com. You think about sleep, you go to Calm.com slash twist, and you will get 25% off a premium subscription. And here is Presh. He's been having trouble sleeping. Uh, he's under a lot of stress. His boss is a jerk. Uh, his boss is also me. Uh, and he browses through the sleep categories of all the different things that might help him fall asleep. And you got a lot of options inside of com.com slash twist. Lots of options. You got nonfiction. You got fiction. You got ASMR. That's that thing where they talk into the microphone. They also have sleep music, which is what I love. Um, and, you know, they have also... Um, a bunch of stuff for kids, so my kids love it. We go to sleep with a sleep story sometimes. And um, he decides he's going to play sleep music instead of a sleep story. And he selects the lullaby to the star soundtrack. And my little preshy poo falls asleep in minutes. Get that sleep, preshy poo. Next time we got to put in this ad uh, a little like presh and a comforter just snuggling up against his com.com uh, phone app. There you go. Go to com.com slash twist. I'm obviously an investor uh, in the company and love the founders there and the team. They've done such an amazing job. 40 million people have now downloaded com and it was Apple's 2017 app of the year. So find out why at com.com slash twist. It's an amazing product. Get some sleep. You're going to need it. And second follow-up, you talked about the quality of startups continually increasing. Between that and with the economy, it seems like every startup can show at least revenue traction. Have you raised your standard for what constitutes acceptable traction for you to make an investment? Absolutely. And it's a great, very astute question. Uh, I think you've read the book at least once based on these questions, and you're paying attention. Um, so I have raised my standard. If there's so many people coming to you as an angel investor that you have the pick of the litter, right? And this is one of the wonderful thing, things that can happen in years five, six, or seven as an early stage investor is that people start coming to you. You have a brand, you have a name, you're a known quantity, you know, you're know, you known to add value. You've got a couple of hits under your belt. It's sort of like being like a musician. Like people are like, yeah, you know, I want to have, I don't know, Migos or, you know, whoever on my album with me and doing a song with me, right? The, the, the hit songs come to you. Right? If you're Mariah Carey or you're J-Lo or you're Katy Perry, there's probably songwriters out there who are like, I want this person to sing my song. So they're bringing you the best 
songs or Spielberg gets the best scripts or Scorsese gets the best actors, right? That's the great part about building a brand. And that's really, if I was going to write a follow-up to Angel for investors, it would be about that moment in time. How do you get to that point where you're the celebrity investor, where you're all the sought after investor, right? Because that changes everything. When that happens, because we only accept seven people into our accelerator, the launch accelerator, we've seen the number of applications go from a couple of hundred to almost a thousand. That means the chances of getting in gets harder and harder, which means we can have companies with more revenue and pay the same price for them. So I have raised the standard. And on the syndicate, I've raised the standard. I tell everybody in our portfolio and I tell companies outside of our portfolio about the rule of 72. If you're an investor, you might know this rule. Rule of 72, very simple. If you take a period of time, let's say years, the number of years it takes to double your money, divide that number into 72. So you divide 10 into 72, you're growing 7.2% a year. Oh, no, I'm sorry. You're going to double your money every 7.2 years. You divide 20% uh, growth a year into 7.2, it's about three and a half years, right? So we tell our startups, we want you doubling your revenue every six months. If you're doubling revenue every six months, come back to us and we'll know because we read the updates, we're likely to give you a preemptive offer. We might invest another million dollars. So that's what we're doing now. We're studying our portfolio to your previous question about you know following on and doing more investments. Doing a preemptive funding is the master stroke. You see that this person is performing. They're doubling the revenue you know, faster than every six months. Well, that means 10, 15, 20% month over month growth. Oh, yum, yumskies. Mm, I see that 20% month over month growth consistent for three or four months. I'm thinking to myself, wait, they figured something out. I mean, I have to dig a little deeper. I have to check, make sure they're not burning through so much capital that it's a blue apron-like situation maybe where the CAC and the LTV got a little out of whack, you may have seen. You don't want people selling $100 bills for $30, but it's very hard to fake that growth with customers who love you. So I think I have raised my standard, yeah, and I keep raising it. And then I wonder sometimes, would these other investments I made actually clear market? With me now, am I missing something? So that could be a leak in your game too. So you got to keep that in mind. You want to still take some risk. So you may, you'll may you see with the syndicate that we're releasing some companies that are pre-launch. And we're trying to do maybe one pre-launch company for every six, seven, eight, maybe 10 even launch companies with revenue. Because we don't want to just limit ourselves to only doing the things that have some numbers on the board. We might want to take some people from the draft. Why don't I take a, somebody from the second round that could become an all-star, right? Draymond Green drafted in the second round. But you know, he got that $100 million contract, right? So that's what we're looking for. We, get, we still want some of those diamonds in the rough that could still develop in the, in the coming years. Make sense? Yes. Hey, speaking of the syndicate, I've made 20 investments through the syndicate. Oh, I love my, what you all are on doing mine? There. What? All on my syndicate. Or other syndicate. syndicate. Oh, wow, that's the great. Deal, the deal flow there is so much better than what I can find locally. Uh, you know, yeah. please keep it up. I could ask you questions all day, but yeah, and thank you for it. being generous with your time. Oh, yeah, no, no. It's Listen, it's it's the great joy of my life, actually, to write those deal memos. And I, and I do think about people like you, Peter. I write that deal memo. I take it serious. I take it serious. And I hope that you, when you read that deal memo, you know that there's 15 people here in San Francisco or so Really thinking through, like, are we presenting you with that, you know, we're, we've got skin in the game, obviously, because we're putting money in, but we don't want to put up garbage. We don't want to put up stuff just to send you a deal. We really want it to be high quality. We want to explain to you why we think it's high quality. And we really want you to have that diversification, hit 30, 40 deals so that you have a chance of an outlier. And we encourage our angels uh, who are partnering with us and who are part of this team sport with us called Angel Investing to join every single syndicate on AngelList, Seed Invest, read every deal memo on Republic and compare them. Look at the quality. Look at the quality of the founders. Look at the quality of the product. Look at the quality of the revenue. Look at the quality of the team and really kick the tires and read that deal memo. And if you look at the detail level we put into that deal memo, Ashley, our managing director and I, and the companies, we force them to do a webinar, right? So you ask those questions. We put the founder's email in there. We put their phone number in there. We tell them, you know, you got to answer questions. If people have questions, you got to send those 10 monthly updates uh, a year. And we really want them to perform at a high level because most of the companies are going to fail. We all know that. So at least if we really do the work up front, we can feel more confidence that we're at least doing the best we can, right? There's going to be risk, but let's have a plan 
to execute against. And the plan is the highest quality entrepreneurs with the highest quality revenue, with the most loved products, with the best customers, right? And if you do that, I believe you have a better chance of winning. And I'm glad to be on the journey with you. Thank you for reading the book and thanks for calling in, Peter. All right, thank you. Have a good day. All right, you too, brother. Okay, let's take another call. I got Alexandra on the line. Are you there? Hi, Jason. How are you? I'm well. How are you doing? Where are you calling from? Vancouver, Canada. All right. Love it up there. Very nice. Uh, where Slack is and uh, Microsoft, a lot of people, Amazon got offices up there. Beautiful town. Yeah, and we have a few uh, amazing Canadian companies has forward here too, and hopefully Care Team is going to be one of the big next success stories. Great. Tell me your question. So one of the things that often investors ask in meetings is what's your competition? And we're entering a market, healthcare, where a lot of things are still done by hand, fax, and verbal and paper. Yeah. And so our real competition is the status quo, but they want to name companies that we're competing with. Mm. So how do you recommend we answer that question? It's a great, it's a, this is a great question and it, from you, and it's kind of a silly question from them, but it's a checkbox question. In other words, you're in a meeting, tell me about your competition, tell me about your team, tell me about your market size. That's in every book about how to be a VC, how to be an investor. These are like the boilerplate questions. You kind of got to have a good answer for them. So typically the way people answer them is they got that quadrant, four quadrants, and in the upper right is you. And the bottom left is like the old people. And then the top left is the dumb people. And the bottom right is like the semi-smart but sort of dumb people. And you're the top right. So if you were going to do it for, you know, uh, trading stocks, you'd be like, okay, what's the cheapest and what's the most, uh, what's mobile? And it's like, oh, Robinhood. It's free and it's mobile, right? And then like, oh, well, E-Trade kind of sucks and Bloomberg is expensive and terminal. So they're at the bottom. They're expensive and it's slow. And this is free and it's fast and it's mobile, right? So you can do that kind of thing. I think what you have to do is when you're in this kind of situation where you're replacing Microsoft Office, right? Like a lot of things were previously done in Excel, right? Excel was the Swiss army knife of SaaS. Now people are like, oh yeah, this used to be, I used to do my ticketing in an Excel sheet. I used to sell tickets and I copy and paste people's name into an Excel. Then they came out with Eventbrite, right? And so people don't buy that, right? And they want you to put Ticketmaster up against Eventbrite, but Eventbrite was going after a different market. Markets that didn't have high price tickets in venues that Ticketmaster owned, right? So how do you make an Eventbrite and say, oh, it's up against Excel? And then people are like, well, that's not a competitor. That's a part of the office suite. So anyway, this is a stupid question that you're going to deal with. And I suggest you zip, zip, zip out of that question. People have not yet built software for this. Nobody's gotten to it yet. People use Excel. People use, you know, uh, Word. They use whatever, Airtable. Airtable's kind of sophisticated. But anyway, people are using these uh, hack together duct tape type systems. But like Eventbrite, we're building it for the first time. Like Slack, yeah, some people used IRC. Some people hacked together their own software. But Slack made it, you know, more formalized, right? Like HipChat did. So I would then go right to your customers and say, here's how our customers did it. So instead of you telling the investors what your competitors are, have the examples of your customers. So you say, meet Dr. Judy Smith. She told us that her office used to put this information on index cards. Meet Dr. J uh, John Smith. John Smith told us he used Excel. Meet Susie. Susie said this. Dr. Susie said that. And now you're using your customers to explain it, right? So if you were looking at Square, when Square said, we're going to build this little card reader, they say, well, who's your competition? It's like, well, people at a farmer's market don't have electricity, nor do they have a phone line. So they're not using one of those old credit card terminals that cost $100 a month to rent that you see in restaurants that need to be mounted on the wall. So they just said, you know what? Screw it. We're going to let our customers speak. Customers speak. Have your customers explain to your investors how they use your product, how they used it previously, and here's the masterful question for you. What would they do if your product went away? So you got some customers addicted to your product, right? Now you ask them, what would you do if the product mm -hmm. went away? And when they say, is the product going away? Can, can we buy a license to it and we'll maintain it ourselves? Please don't go away. We'll play you twice as much. That's what we do. When we're doing diligence on companies, we ask the customers, what would you do if this company went away? How would you solve this problem? So I'm just giving you a little bit of like the next 
question. I'm giving you a little bit about what happens in the room when you leave. All right? When you leave, mm-hmm. this is what we talk about. Is this mm-hmm. solution so good that the customers would freak the beep out if you went away? And that's what you need to do. That's real product market success. If Slack went away, people would be, you know, people who are using Slack, they're, what? Slack's going away? I have all these API integrations. How do I, how am I going to ever run my business without Slack? Like you would cause a heart attack. And you can tell that when Slack went down a couple times, all of Silicon Valley was like, oh, I guess we get the day off. It's a snow day. It's a Slack day. <laughs> you know, it's like in Brooklyn, we'd wake up and be like, how many inches? Two? F it, man. Come on. Let's get to four inches. And we'd listen to 1010 Winds Radio and hopefully they'd tell us that the Severian High School was closed. Oh, no. Only three inches. Not close. Slack goes down. It's snow day in Silicon Valley. That's when you know you got product market fit is when the whole industry is freaked the F out when your service is down. That's what I hope for you. Okay, Alexandra? Take it up to the next level. Uber in Vancouver, so I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> God damn it. Can you imagine? This This is what happened in Austin. Austin went freaking crazy when they kicked out Uber. They didn't kick out Uber and Lyft. They they forced Uber and Lyft to like have this like really a lot of red tape, and Uber and Lyft was like, okay, do you want us to do all this nonsense? We're out. Peace out. And people went <laughs> bonkers. And that's really when you know you have that great product market fit. I wish you continued success. Focus on your customers. You promise, Alexandra? Are you going to focus yes. on those customers totally. for me? Thanks so much. All right. Raise your prices. Yes. Focus on your customers. I'll talk to you guys soon. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Good. All right, everybody. It's been an amazing episode. I love, love, love getting your questions. Email askjason at launch.co. Askjason at launch.co. Or hit us up at TWI Startups, TWI Startups on the Twitter or Insta. DMs are wide open. Get those questions in there. Looking for a couple of follow-up callers. Peter did a great job today. Um... Just a lot of great questions coming in. Saheed, great one. Darius, well done on the Patreon. So I just overall, I'm very pleased with the quality of the, uh, the questions and the call-ins today. We'll see you all next time on this week's service. Bye-bye.